Diagnosis in medicine is considered by most to be the first step in providing competent and safe health care services. It seems obvious that it is necessary to know what the patient complains of before you initiate treatment. Obviously, we don't always know the answer to what causes the patient's complaint, and a diagnosis is not always possible or immediately available. But the general principle is, the nature of the problem will determine the nature of the treatment. In the case of low back pain, I hold the same premise, but that is not universally accepted by many involved in treatment of patients with back pain. This presentation has two parts. First, we will explore the issue of why a diagnosis is desirable or not. Then I will introduce the concept of diagnosis by subtraction, which is my term that describes what I believe I do when reducing the diagnostic possibilities down to either a single diagnosis or a small list that indicates the need for diagnostic interventions that require greater expense and possible invasive techniques beyond the history, taking and physical examination. These are the questions that should be addressed at the beginning. What is a diagnosis? Next we will ask ourselves if it is necessary. Then we will look at the pros and the cons of generating a clinical diagnosis. And finally, in the second part of this presentation, I will describe the process of diagnosis by subtraction, the method I believe that clinicians may use in generating a scientifically valid diagnosis. In order to be clear what we are talking about, we must first define our concepts. For this discussion, I will take the first simple definition from Wikipedia. Here we are saying that diagnosis is, quotes, the identification of the nature of an illness or other problem by examination of the symptoms, unquotes. There are many other more detailed and some more specialised definitions that may be used, but for our purposes this definition conveys the essence of what we do. We examine the patient using the history and physical examination and from this information identify, to the extent possible, the nature of the problem of which the patient complains. In my view, there are three components of a diagnosis in pain conditions. First, there is a tissue, a structural source of pain or origin of the pain. There must be, or have been, some stimulus that originated in some tissue or another. Secondly, there must be something that causes or has caused that tissue to initiate the pain experience. And thirdly, there are always pain modifiers. Pain neuroscience tells us that the peripheral and central nervous system can increase or decrease the intensity of the pain experience. Some of these modulatory capacities are built in survival mechanisms and others are learned or acquired capacities based on what is called neuroplasticity. The next question is, is diagnosis necessary? Well, my first response obviously is yes. If I want to understand the patient's condition fully and I want to be able to select a treatment that specifically targets the condition accurately and effectively. The treatment can of course be watchful neglect or simple observation while the problem self-resolves. The answer is also yes if the patient seeks or actually needs an explanation for the complaint. In persistent back pain it is often the case that the patient wants to be reassured that the pain is not caused by cancer or some other life-threatening disorder. The answer is no if the patient has no concerns and the natural history of the disorder is short and the treatment does not need to be specific or invasive. As you know, many cases of mild acute low back pain settle quickly without the need for specific or invasive interventions. So it is obvious that although we may know the diagnosis, we don't need it and the patient doesn't have to be provided with a diagnosis unless 
that patient has a need or a desire for the knowledge. Now we must address the question as to the relative pros and cons of providing a diagnosis. This discussion is not intended to be comprehensive, but to simply acknowledge the fact that knowing the source and cause of disease is not always helpful for the patient. I am definitely not in favour of willfully withholding information, but I am aware of the powerful impact the words of a respected healthcare provider can have for good or ill. There is evidence that providing patients with a diagnostic label for their complaints is an iatrogenic cause of a poorer diagnosis. Lynn et al. have found that, in certain settings, advice from clinicians and the results of imaging negatively influence disability in patients with back pain. Diagnosis and clinical information seems to result in negative beliefs about the cause of pain that results in increased pessimism associated with disability. There is also evidence that early high-tech imaging is a problem especially. In this sample, 37% of patients categorised as having non-specific low back pain and 80% of those with radiculopathy had an early MRI and that the pathologies identified and reported were at least partially responsible for increased disabilities. This is not to say that we should never do an, an early MRI, but because patients have a right to the information once it is available, we must not do imaging without a rapid follow-up and appropriate explanation about what the imaging reveals. As you know, most of what is revealed is common in people without back pain, and that very few MRI findings have high specificity to a pain condition. This interesting paper, authored by Ben Darlow and colleagues, reports on a nice qualitative study on the impact of what we say to our patients. Of course, patients are influenced by a multitude of factors. What we tell them, what they read or find on the internet, what they see on television or in the, in the supermarket, what famous movie and sports stars tweet, and what their mothers and fathers have taught them. But one thing is clear. Clinicians still have the biggest impact. One major theme that emerged in these researchers' study was that patients should fear their back pain and that there is a need to protect their back. This is not just a temporary effect either. These erroneous or exaggerated beliefs can persist for many years. Now let's look at some of the good things about getting a diagnosis right. This is a negative perspective, but the study shows that in the United States, diagnostic errors are the most common causes of alleged malpractice. And they constitute 29% of all claims and account for 35% of total costs. Bear in mind that these lawsuits arise out of not just mistakes in diagnosis, but in failure to make a diagnosis as well. This suggests that, in the United States at least, Making the wrong diagnosis or failing to make a diagnosis is not recommended. On a more positive note, there is good evidence, of which this is just one example, that patients often seek an explanation about what is wrong. In fact, there is evidence that this is the prime motivation for many patients to seek advice. In this recent paper, Pincus and McCracken report that Offering clear explanations and information about the etiology, prognosis and intervention may improve prognosis. I do note that the word diagnosis is not used here rather than etiology, but I would also argue that diagnosis, properly delivered, is an important part of the information package that a proportion of patients really need as part of a package of care. In my own experience, I regularly witness profound mood changes when a diagnosis is provided that excludes cancer or other serious diseases. Even when the diagnosis is not so benign, patients often are extremely happy to finally have a rational explanation that they can use to make reasonable modifications to their lifestyles. Diagnoses such as spinal stenosis, 
or peripheral vascular disease are examples here. It is obvious that I believe that a diagnosis is important and that it can be delivered to a patient in a manner that is clinically appropriate. I believe also that we must deliver our diagnoses when needed and in a manner that maximizes its clinical utility and minimizes potential for negative side effects. Here is my summary of the debate over the value or otherwise of making a diagnosis in management of back pain patients. The first principle is that if a specific treatment is to be provided, then this must be indicated by a specific diagnosis that is made before the intervention is undertaken. It is a prerequisite. Occasionally a diagnosis is made after the effect of an intervention is known, what is called diagnosis ex juventibus. But it should not be the modus operandi for clinicians, especially if the clinician is doing invasive interventions like surgery. As stated before, the nature of the problem determines the nature of the treatment. This means that knowing which structure is the tissue origin of pain allows the clinician to select the target. Not so important in back pain unless the intervention is invasive, like injections or surgery. Why a tissue hurts determines which specific therapy is most likely to be effective. For example, back pain caused by infection may be helped by analgesia and anti-inflammatories, but antibiotics are much more likely to be effective with less potential for negative consequences. Anti-inflammatories will be effective in many instances of acute and subacute back pain. But if there is a clear directional preference, then movement therapies using a specific direction of mechanical loading and avoidance, at least temporarily, of the opposite movements will be far better and has other benefits too. In addition to the traditional pathoanatomical diagnosis, we now know that the pain experience itself is a brain output which is modulated by many psychosocial factors. These modifiers tell the clinician what treatments can be applied in any individual case, when they may be applied and how much. Summarizing to this point, diagnosis and treatment should address the tissue or structure that hurts, why that structure hurts, why it hurts as much as it does, and why it keeps on hurting beyond what may be expected. This is what a true biopsychosocial model is. Now we turn to the method. How do we make a diagnosis in patients with persistent back or referred lower extremity pain? What is the method? As the title of this presentation states, I call the method I use diagnosis by subtraction. This is not to say that I don't use other clinical reasoning methods such as pattern recognition, because I do. But the essence of a scientific method is analytico-deductive, and the easiest way to describe this is diagnosis by subtraction. Back pain is a symptom, in the same way as arm pain, chest pain, and abdominal pains are symptoms. A symptom is not a diagnosis, any more than a sneeze or a runny nose are diagnoses. Words like lumbago and sciatica are simply names derived from Latin, used to describe symptoms. Lumbago is backache and sciatica means pain referred into the lower extremity from the back. These terms are not diagnoses but descriptions of symptoms. Symptoms are what patients complain of, not a diagnosis. Symptoms occur in individuals, and individuals live within a personal, societal, economic, and political context. Context can affect the severity and importance of symptoms. For the purposes of this presentation, then, it is important to know that there are actually about 200 different diseases or conditions known to produce low back pain as a symptom. Fortunately, most of these are uncommon or quite rare. It is highly likely that you may never see some of them in a full and active professional career. Some are serious and even life-threatening, such as cancer or infection. And fortunately, 
these are actually quite uncommon. In this course, we will spend most of our time considering the most common disorders. However, I will also cover some of the less common and nastier conditions I have seen and encountered over the years. As you all know, national guidelines are available in most developed countries. Without exception, these guidelines divide back pain into three broad categories. Nerve root pain, typically caused by pressure from an extruded or herniated intervertebral disc. Red flag conditions like fracture, infection and cancer. And the remainder are grouped together into a category called non-specific low back pain. This three-part categorization system is called triage, a term that has its origins on the battlefield, where injured soldiers were initially assessed and triaged into three groups. Those who are dead or will certainly die, those that will live but only if they receive immediate treatment, and a third group whose condition is not immediately life-threatening, so can be set aside until the crisis is over. Triage of back pain was developed from within a surgical perspective in an attempt to assist family GPs in identifying patients who should be referred for a surgical opinion and high-tech imaging such as MRI. It is unclear why about 70 to 90% of patients were labelled non-specific, but it may be that the original authors of the concept were surgeons who do have a rather narrow perspective on the problem. To a surgeon's eye, only those conditions that may be verified by high-tech imaging may be considered specific enough to warrant a surgical intervention, with everything else being of little interest, so being labelled non-specific. Whatever the reason, the largest subgroup of back pain patients is called non-specific, without the dignity of at least an attempt at a proper diagnosis. It is our task to open up this black box labelled non-specific by the writers of guidelines to discover just what is causing one of the most expensive and disabling disorders in modern times. So, what does lie within this inaptly named spectrum of cases broadly categorised as non-specific? Well, setting aside the so-called specific cases of nerve root pain and the red flag conditions, it is highly probable that the anterior column, that is the intervertebral disc, is the largest contributor to the mix. Recent evidence suggests that the vertebral body is also a significant contributor. The next subgroups are those cases with facetogenic or Z-joint pain, and then there is the sacroiliac joint, which is commonly ignored because it is technically not of the lumbar spine, so it doesn't rate a mention in discussing lumbar spine pain. These subgroups are known anatomic sources of pain that have been thoroughly investigated for their potential to be pain sources, and the means by which they are confirmed as pain sources in individual patients is now a well-developed science and technical skill set. For now, we can set aside the issue of the quantum of these percentages, but I want to assure you that there are reasons for the choices I have made. Having identified the structures that provide the anatomical infrastructure of noxious input or nociception, we can now expand on this and then consider more complex issues regarding causation. I call the following conditions the Big Five, which are the five most common broad categories of painful pathoanatomic conditions known to cause back and referred pain, and they are the anterior column, that is the disc and vertebral body. Depending on the clinical setting, this will comprise perhaps 40 to 60 percent of all cases. The nerve root complex, which comprises the nerve rootlets within the spinal canal, the spinal nerve itself, the dura mater that invaginates the spinal canal and nerve roots out to the dorsal root ganglion, and the dorsal root ganglion itself. The posterior column, 
the great majority of these cases will involve the facet or zygopophyseal joint, which is a typical synovial joint that may have intraarticular pain sources or a painful capsule. The posterior column also includes the lamina and pars interarticularis, and it is the pars interarticularis that may develop stress reactions and fractures. These stress reactions may be a response to repeated trauma, such as in throwing sports or athletic activities like gymnastics and dance. The posterior column prevalence varies a lot depending on the clinical setting, but in routine primary care outpatient physiotherapy clinics in New Zealand, my estimate is that the prevalence is about 10%. The sacroiliac joint may be painful for a number of reasons. Rheumatic conditions like ankylosing spondylitis often include sacroiliitis, for example. However, the most common picture of a patient with sacroiliac joint pain is a woman who is either pregnant or has recently delivered a baby. The sacroiliac joint is the largest, most stable joint in the body, with very small ranges of motion, even in young women of childbearing age. The amount of force required to sprain a sacroiliac joint in a male older than 45 years of age is huge and is likely that such an injury would cause bone to fracture first. The idea of small, easily provoked minor mechanical displacements, so-called dysfunctions, that are palpable by the clinician trained in such techniques is simply not supported by the vast amount of evidence on this subject. I suspect that most sacroiliac joint pain is intraarticular and inflammatory in nature. I am somewhat sceptical about extraarticular SI joint pain, but acknowledge that the evidence one way or the other is still very limited. Stenosis refers to narrowing of the spinal canal, in which case we refer to central spinal stenosis, or narrowing of the intervertebral foramen, in which case we refer to foraminal stenosis. The causes of various types of stenosis are many and varied. Narrowing may be a congenital phenomenon, but is often associated with aging and degenerative processes, that is spondylosis and Z-joint arthrosis. However, a large anterior spondylolisthesis can cause further stenosis on already congenitally narrowed foramina. Small disc herniations are often asymptomatic, but may cause significant problems in a patient with a congenitally narrowed spinal canal or where previously asymptomatic degenerative changes cause central or foraminal canal narrowing. Central spinal stenosis and foraminal stenosis are not sources of pain as such, but a pathoanatomical construct that may have multiple pain generators. The Z joints, the disc, the dura mater and the nerve roots can all contribute to the symptoms associated with this condition. Anterior column pain is covered in detail in section 3 of this course. Nerve root and dural pain is covered in section 4. The sacroiliac joint and related problems of pelvic instability is covered in section 5. Posterior column pain is covered in section 7. And spinal stenosis and other less common conditions are covered in sections 8 and 9. Knowing that these conditions exist and knowing that it is possible to diagnose them is a first step. The next step is to consider the prevalence of these major subgroups. As you can see, I have suggested the prevalence rates in the last two slides. Next, we will discuss that and why it is important. Now we turn to the issue of prevalence, what it means and how it may be used in clinical reasoning. It is interesting to know how prevalent one condition is compared to another, but just knowing something doesn't automatically make it useful. An observation or memorized piece of information is at best something fixed in the past or present. It does not help us predict or manipulate the future. Parrots repeat observed data, but the reasoning clinician uses it to reach conclusions, predict outcomes, and alter the prognosis. For example, 
Dr. James Suriax, the founder of musculoskeletal medicine, carefully observed many patients with back pain and noted that it was common for patients to experience pain confined to the back initially, but over time, many developed radiating pain into the lower extremity as the problem worsened. He also noted that the reverse was also true. That is, as the pain in the leg improved, so did overall suffering and disability improve. His observation of the relationship between increasing and decreasing referral of pain and respectively worsening the improvement of the back pain episode was simply a record of fact. He was quite passive in the face of this observation, astute as it was. It was McKenzie who took this information to the next level. He reasoned that if we could cause the pain to move out of the leg and into the back, the patient would rapidly improve as a consequence. McKenzie discovered centralization as a clinical sign and a guide to active intervention. The issue of prevalence is similar. We may note that certain subgroups are more likely to have discogenic pain than others, and other groups are more likely to have sacroiliac joint pain or spinal stenosis. Interesting, but not exactly revolutionary. Let's turn it around a bit. Prevalence is the proportion of cases with the disease in question. Let's say that 60% of patients presenting with back pain have anterior column pain. That means before we take any history, observe any demographics, or do any tests, the probability of that patient having anterior column pain is 60%. Expressed as a proportion, we say that the prevalence is 0 0.60, or 60 out of 100. This is the same as saying that the pre-test probability is 60%, or 0 0.60. This is important, as we shall soon see. But for now, remember that prevalence is equal to pre-test probability, and pre-test probability is equal to prevalence. Now we need to consider the clinical environment in which you see patients. For most private practice outpatient clinics, back pain patients are in the age group 35 to 43 years with roughly equal gender ratios. If you are doing pre-surgical triage, the mean age is slightly older and there are generally more males than females. If you work for a sporting organization or have focused your practice on sports injuries, the mean age of your patients is typically younger, say less than 40, and the gender ratios are about the same. If you work in a school or university environment, the mean age will be even younger and the gender proportions are about the same. If your practice has focused on maternal health issues, then the mean age will be 25 to 40, and of course these patients are female. If your practice focuses on the older adult, the mean age will be 60 or more, and females live longer on average, so their proportion is higher than for, for males. If you work in a tertiary referral environment, like a pain clinic, the mean age will be in the 40s, and females will predominate. So how does this help? As you will see, the different mean characteristics of your patient population will affect prevalence. So certain types of practice will see more of one sort of problem than another. That is, the expected prevalence changes, and therefore the pre-test probability of different problems changes accordingly. The majority of randomized controlled trials in back pain research include patients with a mean age somewhere between 38 and 42, with slightly more men than women. The prevalence of anterior column pain is usually about 50 to 60 percent. That is, the pre-test probability is therefore somewhere between 50 and 60 percent. Older patients, though, have a different mix of problems, and they are more likely to have posterior column or Z-joint pain so that anterior and posterior column pain problems are of similar prevalence. Spinal stenosis and the less common red flag conditions like cancer 
are more prevalent than in general musculoskeletal practice. During and following pregnancy, the sacroiliac joint is a very common source of pain, possibly similar in prevalence to the anterior column, with lowered prevalence of Z joint stenosis and red flag conditions. In athletic samples, the prevalence of sacroiliac joint sprains and posterior column problems is higher. Seeing this graphically helps, and it makes understanding of how this is useful in clinical reasoning. In general musculoskeletal practice, the probability of anterior column pain is high, so that before you know anything else about the patient, there is a 50 to 60% chance that the next low back pain patient you will see will have pain from some sort of discogenic or vertebral body problem. The other problems have smaller but similar probabilities. Then you look at the patient's file and you see that the patient is over 65 years of age. Now that changes the probabilities considerably. Now there is almost an equal chance that the patient has Z joint pain and you have to be alert to the higher probability that stenosis and red flag conditions might be the problem. Sacroiliac joint pain is highly unlikely in this age group. The next patient is a 33-year-old woman you know delivered a baby three months ago. The probabilities shift again. Now the probabilities suggest that there will be an equal chance of discogenic pain or sacroiliac joint pain, with lowered probability of stenosis or red flag conditions. Now, of course, a raised probability does not relieve you of the need to actually examine the patient and interpret the physical examination in the light of the clinical history. Understanding how probabilities shift depending on the different basic demographic characteristics of specific patients is not diagnosis. It is the starting point for a clinical reasoning process that leads to a diagnosis. There is one more factor I need to introduce here before we continue. Those who work in tertiary referral environments such as pain clinics are very aware of how non-mechanical, non-pathoanatomic factors influence diagnosis and management. Central sensitization or CNS wind-up is one part of the complex array of issues that may confound and complicate diagnosis and management of patients with persistent pain. Generally, the magnitude of these confounding factors increases with symptom duration and the amount of psychosocial distress the patient is experiencing. Having said that, I have encountered many patients who, after years of disabling pain, display minimal or no evidence of psychosocial distress. Also, I have encountered many other patients whose symptoms are mild and quite recent, but they are clearly distressed and displaying all the signs of CNS wind-up. The point is here is that every individual patient has a unique mix of pathoanatomy driving nociceptive input and central nervous system modulators of the pain experience. The patient with mostly pathoanatomical nociception and few confounders is generally the easier to diagnose and manage, whereas the distressed, depressed and anxious patient with raised CNS sensitivity requires a quite different mix of diagnostic analysis and therapy. We will focus mostly on the pathoanatomical aspects in this course, never forgetting though that pain is an experience of the individual and the individual lives within a social, political and economic environment. Your patient may have endured a very complex history you can never know about in any detail. Every patient has a unique story. We all have a unique story. As James Surex once said, every patient contains a truth. He will proffer the data on which diagnosis rests. The doctor must adopt a conscious humility not towards the patient, but towards the truth contained within. Now we will make use of some of this information, and to do so I will make some assumptions that you may or may not agree with. For now this doesn't really matter, as you will see. Let's start with a statement that there are at least two types of discogenic pain, and 
several causes of vertebral body or vertebral end plate pain. These latter problems have reasonably low prevalence. The most common anterior column problem is what we will call rapidly reversible mechanical derangement that we can identify in the clinic without high cost imaging or invasive diagnostic procedures. The proof of all this we will cover in detail in section 3 of the course. For now, however, please accept this unsupported assertion for the purpose of illustrating how the clinical reasoning process works and leads to a diagnosis. Have a look at this pie graph. Here you see that I have stated that these mechanical disc problems constitute about 50% of the patients presenting in your clinic. Some studies say it is as high as 75%, and in other studies the figure is as low as 25%. For now, this is not important, so please don't get hung up on this issue. You can also see that I have drawn the other segments of the pie, such that non-mechanical anterior column pain is 15%, Posterior column pain is 7%, the sacroiliac joint is 6%, nerve root pain is 10%, spinal stenosis is 5%, and all other diagnoses are 7%. Now we are saying that 50% of these patients have mechanical discogenic pain, and we have determined this by performing a repeated movements assessment. It is this proportion of patients whose symptoms have been able to be centralised. We know from research that these patients all have discogenic pain. So, what does this tell us? Well, obviously it tells us that 50% of the patients have a specific diagnosis of discogenic pain. But what does it tell us about the rest of the patients? The 50% who are non centralizers Since we now have a diagnosis for 50% of patients, we are left with a group that remains, so far undiagnosed. Non-centralizing patients who may have non-mechanical discogenic pain, Z-joint or sacroiliac joint pain, nerve root pain, stenosis or something else. So let's remove the mechanical disc cases and consider the non-centralizers separately. Of the remaining patients, you can now see that the prevalence within this smaller subset of patients has changed. The probability that a non-centralizer has non-mechanical anterior column pain is now 30%. The probability that a non-centralizer has posterior column pain is 14%. Sacroiliac joint pain, 12%, and so on. We also know from research that we are able to identify nearly 90% of cases with sacroiliac joint pain. So these also can be identified and removed from the non-specific cases remaining. Looking now at the cases who are non-centralizers and who do not satisfy criteria for SIJ pain, we can now see the probability of the remaining conditions is higher again. 34% will have non-mechanical anterior column pain, 11% will have stenosis and 23% will have nerve root pain. It is also true that we are able to identify with reasonable certainty those patients with nerve root pain, so these are removed from the non-specific classification. We now have a much smaller group of patients who remain without a specific diagnosis. Now it is these patients who might reasonably benefit from undergoing an MRI scan because both stenosis and most vertebral body conditions that cause pain can be identified on an MRI. Let's say we order an MRI and those cases that satisfy the clinical and radiological criteria for stenosis or vertebral body pain are identified. These two may be removed from the non-specific group as they now have a specific diagnosis. Well, what is left? We have some patients with Z-joint pain or something less common. In reality, an MRI will identify many of the other rare conditions as well. But the point here is that we have engaged in a sequential process of what I choose to call diagnosis by subtraction, progressively removing from the puzzle all those cases for whom a specific diagnosis can reasonably be made. What we are left with is a relatively small group of patients 
whose condition is not yet known for certain and may need further expensive or invasive investigation in order to determine a more precise diagnosis. What we do know is that what is left after diagnosis by subtraction is a much more manageable set of possibilities than what we started with. For now, however, remember these simple tools. Firstly, identify those conditions you can. Consider what is left after you have removed these cases. Proceed forward within your diagnostic capability until you have the smallest possible group remaining. Using prevalence as a probability estimate, you can then state the likelihood of those remaining conditions being the source of your patient's pain. Now, it so happens that I start with those conditions that may be diagnosed by simple clinical means. Mechanical discogenic pain, sacroiliac joint pain, and nerve root pain, and proceed from there. Surgeons generally start from a different place, since they have better access to high-tech imaging. They generally start with an MRI and a neurologic screening examination. In reality, it does not matter where you start. You can start this clinical reasoning process with the diagnosis of any condition, so long as you can estimate the probable prevalence in your patient's sample. What is important is that you don't stop prematurely. Why stop with a neurologic screening examination and an MRI? If you are concerned about costs, why even start there? Why not start with those testing procedures that are readily available, non-invasive and inexpensive, that is, the history and physical examination. This process is not rocket science, but a simple procedure that is drawn from what I do myself when trying to sort out a patient's ailment. It is what I believe most of the expert clinicians I have interacted with over the years do as well. The novel part is being able to describe something in simple terms that on the surface seems complex. It has been called the art of diagnosis, but now that it can be quantified, we may start calling it a science. The next steps in this course will take you systematically through the details of the diagnosis of each condition, what the clinical picture is, what clinical tests are useful and how they may be used, and which ones are useless. The journey has begun.